Good evening, everyone. Time for another Bitcoin report. This is my Bitcoin channel. I am reviving it now after a 15 month hiatus. Uh, the reason I've done that, we're going to see here uh, with the Zero Hedge story. But uh, it's a modest channel. My main channel is Brother John F., and that's a silver channel, of course, silver for the people. But uh, uh, again, they pretty much have the same theme. It is a war of the central bankers against the people, the people against the central bankers. And of course, uh, in my opinion, silver and Bitcoin really are, are both the one number one and two weapons against the central bankers that people can use. Uh, very important votes, much more important votes than the votes that you're going to be casting uh, in the next couple of days for the presidency because obviously that is already a rigged game but uh, the Bitcoin and silver are two ways for the people to vote with their dollars two ways that can make a difference now the thing I want to get to before I get to the main story which is going to be Zero Hedge's covering of the Bitcoin story and Zero Hedge has been pretty much silent about Bitcoin for a very long time and uh, that's the reason why I'm reviving this channel is because uh, we're now breaking into the mainstream but uh, before we do that I want to look at the Bitcoin chart here a lot of the things that I've looked at in the past are gone uh, these things come and go this is obviously something that's again from the Mt. Gox feed but uh, it's from clarkmoody.com it's just a, a live Bitcoin chart and you can see this only this doesn't have long-term view but you can see the recent spike up to near 15 and then the collapse down to 8 which we had uh, I have been trading in and out of Bitcoin with some of the bitcoins I have in my Mt. Gox account but uh, I, I recently got back in I had gone to all cash uh, roughly around uh, this point here 12 or so and uh, at this around 9 when we got below 9 I got back in and I've been buying I'm pretty much all in bitcoins as far as uh, the Mt. Gox account which is just some of the bitcoins I have but so let's go over to Mt. Gox and look at that I wanted to point out something really important about the bitcoin you can see I don't really have a lot of bitcoins here I got about 71 bitcoins in my account but I wanted to cover this issue of where people are saying that bitcoins aren't uh, they're not a legitimate form of money they're not a legitimate way to transact and what's very interesting is when you look at the bottom of the ad funds the funding options on Mt. Gox if you go down you have this very interesting disclaimer at the bottom where they say please be advised that accessing your account via the Tor network and or public proxies may result in a temporary suspension of your account and having to submit AML documents AML is anti money laundering documents so that's very interesting because if it's true that the Bitcoin is just a gigantic scam and uh, it's uh, not a real alternative currency then why do they have this restriction uh, why do they have these anti money laundering restrictions here uh, if you're not familiar with the Tor network just briefly the Tor network is an onion router network the way that onion routers work is that uh, they're uh, a group of people from all around the world who all sign in to this uh, onion router and what it does is it uh, combines all of the IP addresses together so that when a person goes to a particular site the IP address that is reported is not necessarily the IP address of the person who actually went there but maybe a random IP address from within that onion so it becomes very difficult to trace who is actually the person who is uh, coming to the page and in this case the person who is actually doing the transaction now what does that mean 
obviously with Mt. Gox, you have an account. I have an account here. I actually have my account linked to my bank account, so I'm I'm not really trying to hide from anybody but if you were trying to hide from somebody and you were trying to transact in bitcoins and then get it out whether it's via a lot of the networks that they have you can see the list of them uh, there's a, a large list of uh, these accounts that you can use to get your money out but uh, if if it weren't the case that uh, Tor were, were not a successful way to anonymize yourself and that Bitcoin were not a way to transfer funds, obviously you wouldn't have these anti-money laundering restrictions. So that's an interesting thing in and of itself. But the main point we want to get over to is the Zero Hedge article. This is Bitcoin seen through the eyes of a central banker. And uh, this was posted today by Tyler Durden. Quite interesting uh, are tags here. We have Europe, European Central Bank as a tag and Greece as a tag, but we don't have Bitcoin as a tag. So we're going to read some of Tyler's comments and then get to the meat of this uh, article. To us, the ECB superficial amusing take on Bitcoin was merely a source of Friday humor. To others, such as Tour Demonstrator, the ECB's report on virtual currency schemes, which was merely a confused attempt to validate the euro by bashing a prototype electronic currency that others have written far more informed articles on, has far more profound insights into central banker mentality. We are skeptical. The ECB has far more existential issues to worry about than whether people will be paying for that house in Calabria with Bitcoin and it goes on. So that's Tyler's view. Still kind of dismissive, but then again, had to cover the story. So let's get into the PDF here, the meat of the story and why it is that the ECB saw fit to actually discuss the Bitcoin. Uh, now I'm not gonna read this. There's a lot here and I'm gonna link it. You can read it yourself. And it goes into the original function of central banking and uh, an explanation of central banking, why the Bitcoin is a threat to central bankers, and that's very important. And But I want to get to the meat of the matter, and that is the way that central banks are going to combat these virtual currencies and the stratagems that are going to be deployed uh, against it. So let's look at those real quick. What are they up against now? Radically different solutions. The success of Bitcoin and the large media interest in it should be no surprise. This cryptographic currency as well as its future descendants is radically different from the e-money that was around in 1996 and after. To wit, in contrast with traditional e-money, one, Bitcoin is not backed by fiat money or physical commodities. Clearing of Bitcoins happens in a decentralized point-to-point -point network. Bitcoin can operate independently from the banking system. Clearing is ultra-fast and cheap. Money supply is automatically limited by the Bitcoin protocol. Complete discretion is possible. De facto international allowing for even more discretion. As of now, entirely unregulated. Summary. The ECB summarizes the difference between what it calls electronic money known since 1996, and the new virtual currency schemes of which Bitcoin is the prime example as follows. What central bankers are concerned about now, the worries central banks have today go beyond their 1996 issue that they could miss out on some seniorage, seniorage revenues one can imagine the nervousness behind the following statement about virtual currencies whereby a central bank possibly for the first time ever feels like it is really being left out. Quote, traditional financial actors including central banks are not involved. 
The issuer of the currency and scheme owner is usually a non-financial private company. This implies that the typical financial sector regulation and supervision arrangements are not applicable. But it is more than just not being able to join the signage party seniorage party central banks are now in fact faced with very real competitors quote a virtual currency scheme may also be implemented to compete with traditional currencies such as the euro or the u.s dollars supporters see bitcoin as a good starting point to end the monopoly central banks have in the issuance of money so you can see they're very concerned about that this, of course, goes against the function of central banking as a monopolist of the money supply. Quote, in virtual currency schemes, the unit of account is changed. This is not a minor issue. And the ECB thinks, not surprisingly, that their monopoly over money supply should be protected. Now, let's get down to what the central banks are going to try to do about it. This is... Uh, in essence, what my channel has been about, the last video that I did was a summary of the attempts to discredit Bitcoin. Now that the Bitcoin has pretty much stabilized at roughly the $10 price, it's been there for a very long time. It's actually very interesting that the critics have stated that uh, one of the downfalls of Bitcoin is the wild fluctuation in price. But uh, if we look at the stability of the price right now, then uh, that's going to be a counter argument to what they're saying. So Bitcoin has stabilized at roughly $10. You have to remember that it was trading for very large volumes for one penny. So uh, it's still a thousand fold move for the early adopters. Uh, that's better than any stock, whether it be Microsoft, Cisco, AOL, or any stock success story, even Berkshire Hathaway. The Bitcoin has risen 1,000 fold from its inception and has stabilized at the 1,000 fold point. But let's continue. Here are some of the strategies one can discern from the reports. One, the attempt to discredit. The ECB report, honest as it is in places about Bitcoin, is riddled with attempts to put the cryptocurrency in a bad daylight. It is a scheme that poses all sorts of risks for the user that will be used by criminals for all kinds of purposes and that can jeopardize the credibility of the entire financial system as if the central banks themselves have no responsibility in this respect. Here is one quote that can serve as, as an illustration. Quote, Virtual currencies are not only affected by credit, liquidity, and operational risk without any kind of underlying legal framework. These schemes are also subject to legal uncertainty and fraud risk as, as a result of their lack of regulation and public oversight. Two, attempt to supervise. As usual, the first step to to controlling a new initiative is to try and gather information and impose registration procedures. Quote, a likely suggestion could sooner or later involve virtual currency scheme owners registering as financial institutions with their local regulating authorities. The obvious reaction to this suggestion is who owns the Bitcoin point to point network? Answer, nobody, which makes it most likely that financial authorities will focus on intermediary parties such as the exchanges to try to assert control. In the case of the GLBSC, one of the Bitcoin stock exchanges, the threat of supervision proved enough to intimidate its founder into closing shop. The following comment should probably be interpreted in this light. Quote, registering as a financial institution is a similar trajectory to the one PayPal has undergone as it was granted a banking license in Luxembourg in 2007 seven after its service became popular this is not an easy step but it looks like the only possible way to strike a proper balance between money and payment innovations on the one hand and consumer protection and financial stability on the other attempt to regulate whereas in 1996 there were plenty of ideas about regulation bitcoin has left at least the ecb dumbfounded <laughs> 
about how it can impact the development of this new currency. Quote, governments and central banks would face serious difficulties if they tried to control or ban any virtual currency scheme, and it is not even clear to what extent they are permitted to obtain information from them. In the particular case of Bitcoin, which is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer virtual currency scheme, there is not even a central point of access, i.e., there is no server that could be shut down if the authorities deemed it necessary. The only concrete suggestion I could find was to try to impose minimum reserve requirements on virtual currency schemes, which is a bit ridiculous because Bitcoin specifically allows people to be their own bank, not having to rely on third parties to safe keep their deposits. Conclusion, the paradigm of faith-based fiat currencies is 40 years old and it is now faced with a serious challenge. There's a lot of talk these days about currency wars, which many interpret as a fight between central bankers to replace the U.S. dollar with a new world reserve currency. As the recent reports of the BIS and the ECB indicate, however, fiat currencies might all be fighting on a ship that is slowly seeking as, quote, it can reasonably be expected that the growth of virtual currencies will most likely continue. With central banks around the globe well on the path of printing at least the present day fiat currencies into oblivion, investors and fund managers likely do themselves a favor by keeping a keen eye on what is going on in the dynamic universe of decentralized cryptocurrency, where at least for the moment, Bitcoin is the most prominent game in town. So... There you have it. There you have the ECB and Zero Hedge finally recognizing the reality of the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is not going away. It's not going away anytime soon. Now, in the comments, you had people mentioning that the NSA had hacked the Bitcoin and that, uh, that the protocol was compromised. Obviously, that's a bunch of nonsense. If you watched in my video that I did on the Mt. Gox hack. I actually covered the time back in June, the flash crash. You can see this is Bitcoin Report Volume 8 flash crash. Uh, it's about 54,000 views. That's where I caught the flash crash of the Bitcoin in real time. We went down to a penny and uh, from about uh, $17. But uh, again, that was because Mt. Gox was hacked. And that is the type of thing you would see if the Bitcoin protocol were broken. Then obviously, if someone had the power to uh, counterfeit Bitcoins, then the first thing they would do is to deposit those Bitcoins on Mt. Gox or any of the other exchanges. And they would begin to sell them off. And you would see an obvious overrun of supply versus demand and the price would collapse down to a penny just as it did in the flash crash that obviously hasn't happened bitcoin is stabilized around ten dollars so no one has hacked the protocol uh, it's not uh, subject to that anybody who knows anything about encryption knows that uh, the amount of computing power that it would take to hack that level of encryption is not anywhere in the world today and is not projected to exist for many, many years or decades. Uh, there may be some advances in the future that we don't know about, but at the present time, the type of and level of encryption that we have on the Bitcoin is enough to counter any attempts to break into it. Again, the nature of the Bitcoin network, how robust it is in that uh, there's a tremendous amount of computing power in all of the miners. Uh, mitigates against that risk. So this is a very important time for the Bitcoin. Uh, we're probably going to see, my prediction is we will probably see a significant rise from here. So I'm all in on the Bitcoin. I have converted my cash to Bitcoin, at least in my Mt. Gox. That's not my other accounts, but uh, I'm all in on the Bitcoin. I expect to see a significant rise from here. The uh, detractors have failed. Uh, all of the smear campaigns have failed, and now uh, we're seeing the central banks actually step up and take notice.
So it is a significant threat to them, and we're going to see what happens going forward, and we'll talk to you next time.